It is very much a pleasure to be here. I feel very lucky to be here. Um, I was, uh, got up yesterday morning at my house in Seattle and um, was walking to work at the UW and I got an email from United and I was flying through Chicago to come here and they said that my, and it was a 10.44 p.m. flight to Indy from Chicago. Remember, there's an hour difference, so it landed at almost at 1 a.m. And they sent me an email and said that they had canceled due to aircraft maintenance that flight from Chicago to, um, to, from Chicago to Indy, and they rebooked me on a flight today that landed right about now. <laughs> but they didn't tell me, they didn't rebook my Chicago flight to, from Seattle to Chicago. So I, I, it's still unclear to me what they expected me to do from 7.45 p.m. last night until my flight that they rebooked me on left at 11 a.m. this morning. <laughs> they didn't like do anything, but I called them. Unfortunately, United treats their frequent flyers really, really well, and so I called them and they were like, we can't find you a seat, but let's see what we can do. And they came back and said, okay, we're putting you on Delta, which I thought was kind of funny. So I flew on Delta out here through Minneapolis and got, got in actually two hours earlier, which is, Awesome. Yeah, so it all worked out in the end, although it screwed up a couple of meetings at work. Um, so I'm, I was a professor here in Indianapolis. That's my connection to Indianapolis. Um, I was a faculty member in the medical genetics department, and I ran the bioinformatics core for IU School of Medicine for a number of years. And I love giving talks like this, so I jumped at the chance. I like talking to tech crowds. If there's ever um, hackathons, for example, at like Stanford University or at Facebook headquarters or wherever, I would always be there like trying to pitch my ideas. And so I just love working with tech, tech folks. And now I get that in spades as I'm gonna tell you a little bit about in this talk. And I've noticed that every talk so far today has had tons of code in it. I promise you one line of code, but only one line of code. <laughs> um, and that's it. But I think you know, what I want to do is tell you um, and encourage you to use this email and email me if you're interested in what you hear today, because I'm recruiting. I've only been at the UW for two months, and I would love, love to work with data folks that are really interested in, I think, what I would call transformative problems. And I'll tell you about transformative solutions to healthcare. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we're doing this. I learned Python in 1995. I was an undergraduate at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I worked for, as an hourly, in the biochemistry department for the, uh, um, for the, uh, 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 the center, the National Center for Na Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy. Um, I had just finished, I was actually, through most of my undergrad, I programmed for the dean's office, like calculating salaries and things like that. Um, administrative software, all in C and C++. And um, I got this, finally got a job doing science. I worked um, and I brought C and C++ there and the guy who I worked with, my mentor, in the center said, you should learn Python. And I was like, Python, what's that? And so I went to the web URL that's been the same ever since, I think, python.org slash doc is probably, I think it's still there. Um, not positive, and I learned Python and went through the tutorial. And I think that's still where I send my students and, and trainees that come through my lab. I just send them to that tutorial and have them go through it, and we learned. Um, I'm at UW Medicine now. Uh, two, three months ago, I was at a small nonprofit private research institute called the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. UW Medicine is massive, and it's really, really, really big, and it's really, you know, it's, I've been there three months and still just kind of absorbing how big it is. And um, it runs the, what's called the WAMI program, which is all medical training for the states of uh, Washington, Wyoming, Idaho, Alaska, and Montana. Um, we were rated by US News and World Report as number one for primary care and top 10 in research for, for something like 20 some years. Um, and we are number three overall in overall NIH funding, at least in 2010. I couldn't find the number from last year, but I think that's still true today with over more than $300 million a year. Um, in, in funding. We're four hospitals and 20 plus primary care clinics. We have a, a, the, the trauma, uh, level one trauma center that uh, serves uh, the states around us. And we have nine um, emergency units, uh, 20 pharmacies and nearly 300 specialty care clinics. This is a very big enterprise and we have a cancer center. Um, and so we are all about data. We have lots of very interesting problems in data and I'll talk about that. Con concurrently with my move there, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, has funded a project, has funded 
um, a big data to knowledge program where they're actually funding data science directly. And they've recruited uh, Phil Bourne to give you an idea of how much the, the biomedical research community is thinking about data. They recruited Phil Bourne, who was, I think, head of the San, uh, he was at UCSD and I think he was head of the San Diego Supercomputer Center as well. Um, they recruited Phil Bourne as actually as an associate director of all of the NIH, just focusing on data science. So data is really, really big in biomedical research. And I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, that here. Um, and the reason for that is much like Moore's Law, IT, IT needs in research-driven medical centers is growing a ton. We have lots and lots and lots of challenges that we face about trying to integrate data, trying to use data to improve patient outcomes and to understand data. And so I'll talk a little bit today about the transformative changes. I'll talk about, uh, uh, this is a little bit about my vision for how we are going to actually use, leverage clinical data to improve uh, patient care. And then I'll give some examples of some really cool Python projects. And I, if it works, I'll give a demo of, uh, of a really cool Python application in biomedicine. And then I'll talk about the future in one slide, I think. So let's just, let's kind of step back and just think at a 50,000 foot view of, um, of healthcare. Doctor, patient. Doctor sees patient, something happens clinically, and the doctor will then enter that information into a computer. That computer is an electronic medical record. It's a piece of software that sits behind that, uh, behind that computer. And basically, most clinics are now, very well, I shouldn't say most, many clinics are, um, and a, probably a majority of clinics, are connected through uh, an EMR system. And as you know, there are lots of these interactions. They all go into either the same system or if you're at a different clinic or you're being treated for something different, it could be a different system. EMRs are all different. That's the big challenge that we face. All of those 270 clinics, specialty clinics, many of them have different systems. There are rural clinic sites all throughout the five states I mentioned. All of them use different systems to do it, and so we have lots of glue. It was described as plumbing earlier. It is like plumbing, where we have a system. That system is then put into a large database, and then if we ever want to operate on that data, we have to take a step where we call um, an ETL step, where we extract that data out of the database, we transform it, and then load it into a clinical data repository, which is just an aggregate of a bunch of databases, or we put it into a preferably an electronic data warehouse, which has a common data model, which takes all the data that are in these different EMRs and puts them all into one common data model. So you can ask questions like, tell me about this one patient and what their odyssey is through the clinical world has been. So um, as I said, these individual EMRs require a step for data extraction and loading into this repository. There's also a lot of kind of steps that we have to do in terms of the data repository to like deduplicate. So if the same patient, you know, goes to one hospital and also goes to a different clinic that's on different systems, we pull it all together. We need to actually build algorithms that can determine that that patient is the same patient. And it's actually non-trivial. You have to look at things like date of birth and, you know, name and matching things. And there's, there's, there's papers that have been published about how to actually go about doing this. And data from these resources is used throughout the institution. It's not just for research. In fact, they're prim primarily not built for research, but we as researchers want to get access to it. It's used for business analytics. It's used for quality improvement and quality insurance, which, assurance, which is like research, but is part of hospital operations and has a different data governance model than a research model. These can also be used for um, uh, other platforms within the hospitals or within the medical center that depend on this data, and I'll talk about some of those examples. It can be used to respond to regulatory requests or population health data. And then finally, not to be the least number of letters in this list, we use it for research, and research is a big, uh, a big deal as well. Now, um, what I'm going to make an argument for we are at the University of Washington. There's a computer science department at the University of Washington. It's very, very good. And one of the, you know, one of the things that, that CS or engineers want to do is they want to get access to this data. And they want to do machine learning. They want to do all these really exciting things that we love doing in my lab. And what, you, 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 what is really challenging that we work on and spend a lot of time doing 
is really training the investigators, these researchers, to understand that you can't just put a USB in the EMR and copy the EMR onto your USB drive and take it home and do research on it. Because it contains the lives of all of the people that go to U the patients that go to UW Medicine. So we build what we call data governance models. And these models are how we bring data back to the data scientists, people like you. We don't actually define what data researchers get access to. That's done through an IRB or an institutional review board that performs, that includes both scientists and members of the public and other stakeholders for human subjects research, and they review every project. And we get basically these projects brought back to us. Once it gets approved, we'll get the IRB. We review the IRB, and then we determine what data that investigator is entitled to based on that IRB, and then we disclose that data to the investigator based on what the review panel said they should have access to. So we don't actually define what, acts, what data investigators have access to. That's defined by this review committee. And that is going to depend on how patients are recruited, consented, et cetera. Questions that come up, like, for example, diagnose, you know, risks of adverse outcomes from taking a drug. So Vioxx is a, faint, uh, a very well-known prescription drug that was pulled off the market because it was associated with cardiovascular issues. And um, you can ask that question. How many patients were prescribed Vioxx and had a heart attack later? That's a very useful research question. And so we can pull that data out. And an IRB would not be asking questions about genetic tests or something else that the investigator didn't need to know. We also do, so this is, you know, kind of data that's used for research. Individual projects come to us, they're testing a hypothesis, we review the IRB and we disclose that data. On the other side, there are infrastructure projects that use clinical data sets to match basically records in that database to patients. Things like biospecimen banks that are used for research, like tumor samples from surgery, or clinical trials that are happening on campus. Um, electronic data capture. So if we are running a study that's going to collect information about patients, there's a coordinator who's going to interact, interface directly with the patient, and they build forms on a web form that they can then enter on this website for each patient that's secure. And that also is connected to their medical record number or to information in this large data repository. Also clinical genetics. We're now sequencing whole genomes and exomes. This is all the genes in a human genome we sequence as part of clinical pipelines now. And so we need to connect that data back to the patient, and we do this. So this is really complicated. We have a project called DataQuest, which is actually going out to all of these electronic health record systems and all of the, the rural clinics, because the University of Washington, basically all the medical students get spread out to rural clinics uh, throughout the five states I mentioned. Those clinics all have their own EMRs, their own data governance models, et cetera. And so in order to collect all that data back, we have a very specific project that's run by Carrie Steffens, Stevens and, and Laura May Baldwin, where they go out and they work with those sites to move that data into a data repository. And then that data repository goes through another ETL step where, um, another ETL step where it's put into what's called a common data model so that we can query across the sites. To give you an idea of how these queries work, um, oftentimes what we do, because all of these different sites, clinics, have different data governance models, like different ways that they are releasing or interested in releasing data, we actually do SQL queries, you know, basically queries that go out to the sites and then a human determines whether they're actually gonna run that query based on what they want, based on their model that they have at their clinic. So it's, it's federated databases, queries, um, and qu humans actually determine whether certain queries that come across, the, across to the different sites will actually be run based on what their rules are. To give you an idea of how complicated, this is not our main uh, uh, clinical data repository. Our main one is based on Amalga, a a formerly a Microsoft platform now run by Caradigm. It is incredibly, oh, you can't even read that. It is incredibly complicated, and this is from 2010, so it's a little out of date, so all of these boxes, it's, are, it says that they're, old, they're not done yet, but all these boxes are now done, 
And what I'm going to point to you is our repository has data from all the different departments, like emergency rooms, et cetera, pushing. Some of it pushes in real time. Some of it pushes daily, monthly, et cetera. And it all goes into this large clinical data warehouse. In 2010, it has 3.8 million patients in it. Um, and I believe now it's in the four million somewhere. And it's uh, well, well over 60 data sources. I don't actually know how much it is. It's more than 40 terabytes of data, to give you an idea of how big this is. And um, it's growing uh, uh, a lot. And, we, to get, and again, there, in terms of governance, there's an oversight committee that reviews and um, uh, determines what this is all used for. I guess why I'm telling you this is that not everything that we do is in Python, but Python is really useful for gluing tools together. And so this is something that where you would imagine seeing a lot of Python code. Again, I'll give you some examples of that coming up here. So we then, once we create this clinical data repository, which exists at the University of Washington, we can then pull data from that to connect to other infrastructure. So for example, we've created a de-identified clinical data repository for many, that's used for many purposes. Um, because it's de-identified, there's no patient that you could actually identify in there, and we're very careful about how we do that. We can then use that database without getting, going through the, the overhead of this ethical review to like identify you know, how many patients at UW Medicine were prescribed Vioxx. We can ask that question without a review because we don't know who those patients are. And so because it's de-identified, we created this to enable kind of research. We also have, as I said, exome sequencing. We have specimen management, which is discarded blood and um, tumors and surgery, surgery samples. Um, we have cl a clinical trials management system that is one of the things that I'm working on bringing online now. Um, and we have uh, uh, clinical study data. This is the extraction step that I mentioned for researchers when we pull data out and give it, disclose it to the researcher. And then we also have uh, data capture using a tool that's based on PHP called REDCap. Basically, for all of these platforms, I can show you a graph that looks like this. This is why my position was created. I'm the first CRIO of UW Medicine, and it's basically supporting this curve as when we build informatics platforms that are used by researchers, just general ones. This is electronic data capture for researchers that are collecting any sort of data that are there. Um, it's going up. And everything that I showed you on the previous slides all go like this. And so they create these positions to basically give a voice to research IT within the comp clinical computing environment because research IT is very, very different than supporting a 24-7 electronic health record at a hospital or a trauma center. All right, so what's the message here? Enterprise research and analytics systems in major medical centers are incredibly large and complex. There are many, many platforms and there's lots of glue that connects these platforms together. What we really want to do is we want to do this you know, awesome data science on this data. And the major hurdle to doing that is these, these required and important data governance steps to make sure that really that private data that we all share when we go to the hospital is not disclosed without consent or without um, adequate ethical review. Um, and we have to follow ethical, uh, sorry, uh, federal regulations such as HIPAA, HIPAA, internal access to EMR data is logged. So anytime a clinician, even within a hospital or anytime anybody accesses any medical record, it's actually pumped out and logged. And we do that, uh, again, some of the code that does that is Python. It basically builds, I think it's done through, actually, I'm not sure, I think it's done through a CSV file. They basically create a CSV file that said this person accessed this medical record for this reason. It's all automatic, and it gets pumped through a, web, a, a secure web service and logged in a database. When we actually release data for research based on this ethical review, that's actually disclosed to a privacy office, and you can, patients can go to our privacy office and ask, when was my data accessed for any reason, disclosed for any reason, and get, you'll get a list of all the places where your data's been disclosed. This is very important. So, what does that mean? So where, how do we actually do data science? That's the hard part, right? So it's given all of these governance rules. Well, so we have a clinical data firewall. These are, you know, anything that happens inside of this is, is essentially healthcare operations, and we only, data only gets out for, for very specific 
reasons. So for example, the de-identified clinical data repository I mentioned, research disclosure based on an IRB, ethical IRB review for a project that a scientist is doing, a researcher is doing, and then also this infrastructure that I mentioned before. But internally, we're trying to build, we're not quite there yet, but we're trying to build, you know, things like the capacity to manage text, to look at unstructured data, like clinical notes using natural language processing. We're also doing data mining, and we want to do machine learning. And what's really exciting, this is why I took this job, is what's really exciting is if we can put this all back together, we want to actually loop it back to the electronic health record and do decision support or at least support in some way based on the patients that are in the database. It's basically the patients like me approach. How did other patients do when they were treated similarly with similar issues? This is kind of our dream. We don't know how to do this yet. This is a long process, but we're still working on it. So where is, um, where is Python used? So Python is used sporadically throughout this. It's used as glue. Um, we have lots of MVC web front ends like Django, um, Flask, for example. Um, we have uh, you know, some reports that are pulled out of the data set, the, the data repository that, uh, use, that use code. Specific scientific software uses Python, and I'll give an example of that. Natural language processing. Uh, and analysis of text, and then finally data wrangling is also something that's really uh, used a lot. So of course in my group, so I'm going to now kind of merge into more of my research program than um, my research program than my, uh, uh, my IT research IT role. We, we support databases of what we call locus specific databases. There's diseases, this rare disease called mucopolysaccharidosis type 4A or Morchio syndrome that occurs when patients have a mutation in a certain gene called the GALN-S gene. And when they do that, they get what's called a lysosomal storage disorder. And, patient, and clinicians or gen, clinical geneticists, when they sequence that gene, they suspect the patient has this, they sequence the gene, they find a variant, they'll go into this web resource, again, running on Django, and look up their variant to see whether that's a path, pathogenic, whether it's causing the disease or not. And then they can then say, well, it causes disease, therefore this patient has that disease because it may be a number of other rare diseases that they might actually have. So we now, so I'm going to give some vignettes of what we're doing with other areas. So the human genome is now sequenced clinically, all is actually sequenced clinically. Um, uh, uh, maybe not a whole genome relatively regularly, but it's coming very soon. Um, has anybody here had their genome sequenced, their whole genome sequenced? Nobody? In five years, I think a lot of you will raise your hands. Ten years. We'll say ten years. I'll be, I'll, I'll, we'll go, we'll go. I won't quite, quite that fast, but I think people are going to have their genome sequenced. We're still unclear about how we actually do this, when we do this, et cetera. There's a lot of ethical discussions about when to sequence genomes. Should we, is it even appropriate to sequence the genome of an asymptomatic individual? Clinical care is all about having a problem. You have a problem, you go to the doctor. So should we actually be doing se genome sequencing for those people who don't have problems? These are all very interesting questions. The genome is huge. It's three, each copy is three billion base pairs long. So it's A, G, C, T, this letter that you remember from your, your basic biology, and it's three billion bases long, and there's about 25, 20 to 25,000 genes somewhere in that neighborhood that are spread across about 1.5% of the genome. And so we sequence those genes typically clinically. That's where we're, we head for. It's a lot of data. I think, I don't know if I have a slide on it, but, but each individual, if you were to sequence my genome and compare it to the draft three billion long base human genome in the public genome databases, um, I would have probably somewhere between three and four and a half million differences on my genome compared to the one that's in the database. And for, say, MPS4A, this disease I showed on the previous slides, there's only one mutation that causes that. So one out of four and a half million. So our job is very, very hard to do. Um, in 2010, we did a, uh, we, not we, so another group at Stanford did, sequenced a single genome with a technology, looked at known clinically interesting variants like pharmacogenetic variants, which are the association between drug treatment and response with genetics. And now, in Europe, the Thousand Genomes Consortium has released more than 25, I think around 2,500 whole genomes that are very accurately sequenced of normal individuals. 
like healthy, sorry, not normal, healthy individuals. And, um, and so we can use this kind of as a collective analysis of like what genomes actually look at. So why do we do, why is genome, you know, why is this interesting? Well, the human, the original human genome cost $300, $300 million in 2001, probably more if you count kind of side funding or side efforts that were done. And actually, genome sequencing costs, this is the outdated figure, I have an updated one, but the, the, if you Google it, it just shows right up. It's far outpacing Moore's law in terms of cost of sequencing. And so now we can sequence, the technology is available to sequence for about $1,000 a whole genome, all six billion bases, because there's two copies of this three billion base pair long sequence in a human. And when we do that, we'll create this list. We don't have to store the whole genome, we just store the differences in the genome that we observe. And we store that in a flat file that is called a VCF file that is gonna have those four and a half million versions of it. When we parse it, Python. Annotation is like the key to this, so but there's lots of resources out there that curate and, you know, curate and basically determine is this variant pathogenic, is it not pathogenic, what does it mean if a patient has this variant in their genome? And so we're building massive databases. dbSNP, which is the public repository of all genetic information in humans, it's maintained at the National Institutes of Health. It's not associated with individuals, it's just a, this variant has been observed in this population frequency. And there's now more than 45 million of these sites that are known, that are, that are around the human, again, the human population. The disease database of the variants of the, which of those 45 million caused, caused disease has more, I think this is more than 120,000 now, different variants that cause disease. We have no, hundreds of variants that are known to be associated clinically with treatment response. And we now know many what we call somatic variants. These are spontaneous variants that cause cancer, hundreds of thousands. So lots of questions. So one of the things we did, so this is a, actually a great example. We did a hackathon at Stanford that I participated in. I went there. Um, I didn't even bring my own projects to run. I just said, I'll just participate on a team. This uh, uh, investigator at Scripps came up and said, I want to build a tool that's easy to do variant exchange. Python, so basically, we take public resources, we pull the variants down, and we JSONize the annotations that describe the variants, and then we collect it all together in this repository, create a web service, so you can just call and say, give me that variant, and it gives you some JSON, and you can know all about that variant that's from all the different resources that are available. This is a hackathon, it was a two-day thing at Stanford, we went there, I spent, I, I spent the day just kind of like, you know, hacking da these databases and pulling down variants, and I did my own code, right? I wrote my own code and, you know, produced tons of JSON that I, that I shipped down to San Diego. And um, we just got a grant award yesterday. We got the final award on it. And this is, I believe the grant's more than a million bucks, um, all focused on this project from a hackathon. So these hackathons are a lot of fun and they actually do have value. Um, and so this is forthcoming. Now, I, we haven't thought about this project since the hackathon. That's all we did was that one weekend, wrote a grant, got funded. Um, visualization, so Python is used for two major stru protein structure or structural, 3D structural visualization of image data, either like X-ray crystallography data of proteins like this or this or nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy data or even image volume metric data are all the two major players in this are UCSF Chimera and Pymol. And they're both based largely on Python. And I'll give a demo here in a second of Chimera if I can make it work. And, um, and this is used very, very, very widely. Um, and it's, I think, I personally think, I'm on the advisory board, so I'm a little, and I got my PhD in this group, so I'm a little biased. But um, I personally think this is the coolest, app, one of the coolest applications that is largely built on Python. It's, it's a, uh, you'll see it in a second. Um, it's really, really, really amazing. And um, it is used in science all the time. It's been on many, many science and nature, which is the premier biomedical publication um, of basic research. It's been on cover many, many times, images that are, that are derived from this. So um, web services can talk to Chimera, so you can actually write a plugin. When I was here at IU School of Medicine, I wrote a plugin, actually I didn't write anything. Uh, Randy Highland at the Pervasive Technology Labs and someone who worked for him named Charlie Mode 
Neither of them are here, right? I haven't seen either of them. I thought they might be. Anyway, they're both here. They're, I think they're both still around. Wrote a plugin for Chimera that was based on Python that talked to web services so that you could basically pull data from the Protein Data Bank, which is place, you know, protein structures that are stored at San, in San Diego. They have web services that are at uh, the University of California, San Francisco, the group that develops Chimera. And then my own lab had, our, had web services as well. And so we wrote a plugin that you could actually use and you just call, you know, type in some uh, uh, some things and it'll go and pull that data down and, and, and talk, talk about it. So I can give you an example just really quickly of, of Python. Um, if I can, are we still there? Oh, awesome, we're still there. And I will pull up Chimera. So this is Chimera. Ooh, it does not like that. Okay, so this Chimera window here, this is uh, uh, largely Python. So they originally built it entirely in Python and there were some performance issues, so they had to, they redeveloped some of the underlying code in C. So there is some C here. To prove to you that it's, uh, that it's Python, I can uh, bring up the idle window like this, and I'll do, I think for today this is appropriate, Python. I printed high if you can't read it. Um, and uh, to give you an idea of how this works, we will open. We'll use a web service, oh, no, that's not it, sorry. Um, we will fetch by ID, and we will go one FFK, and when I push this button, we are gonna go and make a request to the UC San Diego, and we're gonna ask for a, the database entry of this structure called one FFD, and we'll fetch it. Ooh, and the IO window even says things. And we load it, so we just loaded it, 64,281 atoms, this is the human ribosome, won a Nobel Prize. This structure won a Nobel Prize. Awesome, Python. And uh, we can, uh, 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 let's, uh, we'll actually show all of the atoms. Oops, assuming I can do this. We are now showing the bonds and all of the 65,000 atoms of the ribosome. Anyway, you can play with it, you can do surfaces, it's really cool. And um, this, this application is used, I don't know why it's going backwards, but anyway, I, I used to know how to use this, I don't really anymore. That's okay. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's Chimera, and uh, it's, it's, again, very heavily used. You can download it, it's, it's free for anybody at cgl.ucsf.edu slash Chimera. Just pull it down, accept the agreement, and it'll just work. Um, okay, so the, uh, when do I finish, what time? Because I re-stud that, it's a lot. What was that? I have 34 minutes left? Oh, awesome. 25 minutes after, right? Oh, okay, awesome. So natural language processing. We wanna compute with unstructured data. Clinicians love to write notes. Their notes all over the EMR. How do you compute with those notes? Because we can describe patients based on what's being written or the physicians are written. So that's a very interesting question is can we use natural language processing to understand what the meaning of those notes are. So for example, when you go to the doctor and you get diagnosed with something, you get a diagnosis code. Remember those little yellow pages that you had to walk out of the clinic with? They had a little diagnosis code called an ICD-9 or an ICD code. It's about to be ICD-10. And I'll talk more about this in a second, but you get a diagnosis code. It turns out that those diagnosis codes are really poor at representing rare diseases. So I talked about mucopolysaccharidosis type 4A. If you get that diagnosis code, you have MPS 4A, but you might also have 10 other diseases. And if we know what the disease is, we know what mutations you have, and we know what gene you have mutations in, because all these different diseases have different mutations and different genes that are mutated. So that's an interesting science question, research question. Can we identify MPS 4A patients from a large hospital EMR based on text? because the diagnosis code is not sufficient. We can get a group of them, but we won't know which disease they have. So that's a very interesting example in that the, the clinician, presumably, is gonna be writing MPS4A patient. But what if they wrote Morchio syndrome or mucopolysaccharidosis type 4A and they misspelled it? <laughs> this is all like, these are all issues that we do. But also there's text that's also attached not only to notes, but also things like lab tests. Um, people publish papers all the time I can show you a plot, I'm not going to, but I could show you a plot where the amount of papers being published is going like this, and the amount of data we're curating from papers is going like this. 
and, we, and, and there's a big disconnect between the amount of science we're publishing and the amount of curation we're doing to basically database that research data. So we want to use an NLP to understand those, that, those papers. So for example, if someone publishes a new MPS4A mutation that's in the Galen S gene, you know, someone has to read that paper and put it in our database. It'd be awesome if we could build automated tools that could pull out these out automatically. Web pages and clinical study metadata is an example. We use ontologies a lot. Again, um, these are controlled vocabularies that describe a domain. ICD-9 is probably the most commonly used, well, I, I'll say ICD because there are different versions of it, is probably the most used ontology in the world. That's my guess, And because every time you go to the clini clinician and get diagnosed with something, it puts a, uh, you, you'll get that, that code. These are, not only are they a controlled vocabulary, but they also have relationships within them. So you can uh, basically say that carbohydrate binding is a type of binding. This is from gene ontology. It's a basic research ontology that describes functions of genes and proteins. And they have terms, and they have keywords. So we can then, if we have a protein in a database, we can then annotate it. So there are lots of open biomedical ontologies. The National Center for Biomedical Ontology at Stanford or NCBO actually collects these all together. It's actually a really interesting problem to connect ontologies together. Like if you have an ontology, okay, thank you. If you have an ontology that says, um, that says uh, you know, that has Parkinson's in it, and you have another uh, ontology, like say disease ontology, and then you have another ontology, say ICD, and it also has Parkinson's disease in it, how do you know that they're the same concepts? Because both terms represent the concept of Parkinson's, but you don't really know how to connect them. This is a huge problem. Pathologists say neoplasm. We say cancer. It means the same thing. Um, when I was here at Indiana, a very simple thing that we did, we had all these clinical studies that were on campus, um, cl uh, clinical research studies that were on campus. We wanted to classify them by the disease. So we took the metadata and we ran it through what's called the annotator, which recognizes these ontological concepts in text, and that allowed us to bin them by different diseases very easily. So we just took the metadata that's all publicly available data, we sent it to a web service, again, using Python, it went into the web service and then outspit a bunch of those IDs for those terms from different ontologies. And we took the disease ones out and then we built a web page that classified them. So you say, I want all the studies on Parkinson's disease, you click on it and it pulls up automatically all the studies at IU on Parkinson's disease. We can also use this for enrichment analysis. We, uh, one of the nice things about concept recognition as opposed to syntactic understanding and true NLP where we actually understand the syntactic uses of terms, it's super fast. So we can scan uh, millions, tens of millions of documents in a single experiment very easily. All, again, all using web services. We just stream the data over to Stanford, they annotate it and stream back the IDs that come back. And so this is like a human genome. We take all the IDs of the different genes that have descriptors, it's actually proteins, but whatever, and it gives you all this text that describes the gene or the protein. We run that through the web service and then we get a bunch of controlled vocabulary terms back that we can store in a database. And those are annotations, automatic annotations. Why is this useful? Well, it's useful for tons of things. It's useful for understanding, um, you know, it's useful for annotating things but, and building like ways of browsing data, but it's also, used, it's also very useful for actually doing science where you can do enrichment analysis. So if you do an experiment, identify 10 proteins, well, the first question you might ask is what are the terms that are common in those proteins that are different from the rest of the human proteome or the genome? And so we can do enrichment analysis and say, ah, all of these proteins have been previously associated with Parkinson's disease. And the method will say, I don't know what experiment you did, but you just did an experiment that came up with a result of Parkinson's disease for some reason. And then you can use that to generate a hypothesis. We are also very interested in data mining. We want to connect statistical and machine learning data with patient care. We want to build what we call the learning healthcare system. You can Google it. Um, this is not my data. It's from Nigam Shah's group at Stanford, where he went and looked at Vioxx. Um, and uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Vioxx diagnosis, and my myocardial infarction, um, and heart attacks, and basically what he's plotting here, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail about it, but every, do every dot here in here is a diagnosis code from the medical record, and basically anything that fits this pipeline, rheumatoid arthritis, Vioxx, and then some other diagnosis in the future is represented as a, as a, as a dot here, and anything that's above the line 
are disease diagnoses that are happening more often than you would expect by chance with Vioxx. That kind of is a, this is a great big data question. Why, how do we deal with the fact that there are so many false positives here? Heart attack is only one of these. And things that are over here are more common than these. This is a million. So a million patients in the Stanford database have this diagnosis. It's probably something like hypertension, something really common. So how do we actually do this? So I mentioned before we have this clinical firewall. What we would like to do is build the capacity to do statistics and machine learning within that firewall and to connect that back. Again, this is all, uh, what was the term we used to before? Vaporware. This has not been done, but we, this is things that we would, you know, this is my mission over the next decade at UW Medicine is to make this happen so that doctors can understand how other patients deal. And we can, we can spit out the de-identified clinical repository, which we can do data science on. I'm not going to show any examples of this, but you can because it's de-identified and you can then play around with that data. We're also very interested in mHealth. We actually have created a system where you can take your iPhone, your iPhone, your Fitbit, whatever, you can pump it into Microsoft Health Vault, and then we can actually push that back into the electronic, the electronic medical record at UW Medicine. So that's possible to do. Great for research studies. How do people after, ortho, you know, after surgery respond to the surgery? Are they walking around? You could collect the number of steps they're taking as part of that study. And you, all, any of that kind of health-like data can be used for research, and you can put you know, Fitbits on everybody. And then we can integrate that directly in the medical record. Um, so we also are interested in social media data. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a fun project in my group. Ooh, five minutes, awesome. I'm, I'm right on time, actually. Um, uh, social media data, and, and um, so social media has been used for a lot of different things for research. Um, adverse out events for drugs. There's a number of funded projects that are looking at, at Twitter feeds and adverse events. You know, someday one person says, I took this, I'm taking this medication that the doctor prescribed me, and then two days later they're like, I got sick. Apparently people do this. It's re research that's ongoing. People do that. Um, as kind of a, uh, what are other, there are other projects too that people do, that researchers are doing with social media. Um, sentiment analysis is very common. Uh, you know, to depression, things like that are all very, very common with social media. Um, um, what I'm going to tell you about is a fun project that we did with Reddit. I've already seen Reddit on one of the talks on the browser that pulled up earlier. Somebody was on Facebook and, and Gmail and Reddit. They had their priorities in order, I think. And, um, and uh, 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 I, no offense, by the way, whoever you are. Um, anyway, so Reddit is, 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 how many people here are Redditors? I bet there's a lot here, right? Awesome. Okay. So Reddit is huge, right? 6% of all, of all Americans are estimated to be on Reddit, and they get about 32 million users a month and a billion page, page views a month. What's really cool about Reddit compared to other, res other, webs other social media sites is it's anonymous. People hit, hide behind pseudonyms. So you can, um, they hide behind pseudonyms, and the data is open. So we actually downloaded Reddit. We downloaded about 350 million comments from 4.5 million Reddit pseudonyms um, for about 75,000 subreddits. I, in fact, I think that data is actually on this laptop. And uh, it was all Python code that I wrote myself. Um, and we pulled down every subreddit. I connected to someone else who was building that database. So I, I didn't actually build the database for Reddit. I was just talking to this database. But I wrote Python code that went there. We downloaded every comment for every user as, as, as JSON. And so for any user on Reddit of those 4.5 million, we do something in the whole data set, we can ask what subreddits have they commented in and what was the text of those comments. And so we did this. And so what you notice is if you take users, so if you take users and you like annotate whether they're commenting in certain subreddits, so like all these people have commented in, in IAMA, and some have commented in fitness. Oh, I, I put the dots in the wrong place. I actually redid this to fit in my slide. So this should be, Arnold Schwarzenegger should be in fitness, not trees. <laughs> so tree, trees, is, trees is the subreddit for the advocacy of marijuana use. Um, and <laughs> this should be over here. And um, anyway, so you can see that some people are more similar to other the, the people. So who's your friend on Reddit? Right? Like, who's the pseudonyms that are most similar to you? Well, we did this, and we actually built a similarity metric so we can take two users and compute how similar they are based on the, um, the subreddits that they are commenting in. And the cool thing about this is we use 
an, an, we used an NLP statistic that takes into account how inform, what we call informative. That means if I'm posting in Seattle, it's much more informative to find someone else who's posting in the R Seattle subreddit than it is for somebody posting in, say, IAMA. Because everybody posts in IAMA. So what can we do with this? We're like, we've got this kind of cool thing. We thought about like, using Reddit as an honest broker, what we call an honest broker, that is you know, a, a, a way of disclosing data without disclosing enough data to embarrass yourself, because I'm sure most of us wouldn't probably want to like, talk about our Reddit IDs, or a lot of people don't. Um, so we thought about like, making an app where you could go up and like, you know, put your app next to someone else's app, and it'll tell you how similar you are without telling you that you're posting in our trees. <laughs> Right? You could do that, right? So that would be like one of the cool things that we wanted to do. I, I, had, I worked with a couple of students at USF. Yeah, I'm, I'm stopping here. And um, uh, USF, University of San Francisco in computer science, who were actually playing with this. And I'd love to, we never finished this project, but I would love to do that. Um, but, uh, uh, but we could also use this for research. And so my friend, Nick Tatnetti, who's director of clinical informatics at Columbia, had this idea, I talked to him, and he's like, oh yeah, I love Reddit, and so he, here's an idea. And he came up with this like, kind of neat idea that was um, a little uncomfortable for me personally, but I did it, so what we tried to do is we tried to build a, build a predictive algorithm that predicts Redditors' weights. <laughs> I'm not kidding, and it was a little sensitive for me, but what, how did we do that? Anybody want to guess it's a Redditor? What's that? We need training data, right? We need to know how much people weigh. Uh, lose it and progress picks and all Lose that. it, exactly. We went to lose it and people put their weights in their comments. And so we parsed out 2,800 user weights from comments and then looked at what subreddits they were posting in. What was the most predictive subreddit? This is an easy question. Predictive in that lots of people are posting in it and it's associated with weight. Fitness is a good one, it's associated, but it's not enough people don't post in it to be predictive on its own as a feature. It wasn't trees? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> that's also not big. Actually, I'll give you a hint, it's a default. Because that's where everybody's posting, in general. It's a de there are certain subreddits that are defaults. When you log in, that's the ones you get, and then you can choose one. <laughs> no, that's not a default. Um, uh, <laughs> The, I hate to tell you all, video games <laughs> are gaming. If you weigh between 100 and 200 pounds in our data set, you have about a 25% chance you've posted in our gaming. If you weigh between 300 and 500 pounds, it goes up to almost six, 60%. <laughs> and it just goes up like this, video games. Anyway, this is awesome, funny. I love that. We really should publish this. We never published it. I don't even know where to submit it. Um, <laughs> Reddit, Reddit, Reddit. <laughs> yeah, Reddit. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. exactly. Um, anyway, so what are we doing with this? Actually, we looked at alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use. It's something the NIH is interested in. And you know, for every subreddit of like you know our trees, there's also a corresponding one for people who don't you know are trying to quit. Does anybody know what it's called for marijuana? Our trees is, is the marijuana one. Lumber. Our leaves. I love it. <laughs> leaves. Anyway, so that's the, and there's smoking, stop smoking, drinking, stop drinking, etc. for all of these different subreddits. And so we can, act, and we can track users between their usage of these different subreddits. And so what we proposed was to take this network and try to identify, this is very important to know, is if we can use pseudonyms in a social, media, in a social network, can we use that to put risk scores? on people based on their susceptibility to ATOD dependency or use. And this is, you know, your, your employer could do that. This would be a reason why you wouldn't want to say who, what's your Reddit ID when you apply for a job or your Facebook ID. Because your employer could do the same thing that we do. And so this is like really interesting questions that we wanted to ask. Anyway, it wasn't funded. I'm still trying to chip, shop it around. But um, I think very, very, it, it, Reddit is an awesome place for doing science because of the fact that it's, it, that it, everybody's anonymous. They talk about things they wouldn't normally talk about. It's a high-tech community, um, and uh, it's a high-tech community. The statements are all public that people make, um, and uh, we can, I, you know, identify online 
behaviors. We wanted to, what would really be awesome is we could then go out and communicate, use Reddit actually what we call an honest broker, that was somebody who would mediate communications with individual users without disclosing who that user actually is, if that makes sense. Because normally if someone does an epidemiological study, they identify people, they talk to those people with Reddit. You could do it without keeping them anonymous using Reddit itself to do that. Anyway, I always thought that, I thought Reddit was a great thing. Anyway, so future. We're very excited about the learning healthcare system. Another issue is e-consent and consent management. We now consent people for research use for a whole pile of different things, and it'd be really neat if patients could log into a website and see what they've consented to and what their data is being used for. Um, precision medicine, you, Obama actually mentioned precision medicine in his State of the Union address. All, a lot of my friends actually sp are spending their time at the w White House now working on this. Dan Macy's is in our department and is part of the faculty search that I'm chairing for precision medicine, spends a lot of his time at the White House actually working on the precision medicine initiative. And how do we, you know, in, you know how do we actually use data to improve patient care. Um, the blue button, the idea that you can download your own medical record, which they're calling the blue button, you push a button and your medical record comes to you and you can use it for whatever you want. You could submit it to you know, Health Vault or Google. You could submit it to a research project. You could just put it on your own computer and not do anything with it. Very interesting idea. Anyway, if you want to do data science, like really, really cool data science, send me an email. I would love to, I'm, I'm hiring at least one person who can do uh, Python coding. And you won't make as much as you will with Amazon, which is right next door to my building. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it's more academic and it's a lot of fun and we get a lot of flexibility in the kinds of projects that, that we do. So um, send me an email, thank you very much. And uh, if there are questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's a lot of work. That's, I mean, that's the, that's the answer. It's, there are people that do all of this very carefully. And, um, uh, and it's, uh, it's hard to budget. And the, the, team, the, the team that just manages that clinical data repository, just that one repository is to more than 25 people. Um, and that doesn't include any of the folks that I mentioned that do research projects. It's just managing that, that process. And that ETL step is where you actually pull data out requires expertise um, and you know we're just it's essentially you know copying database a database the heart where it gets really hard is if you want to put that data into what we call a common data model that is a specific schema so it's all the same so you try to actually synthesize all of these different databases to describe because they're all describing approximately the same thing we want to synthesize them and all put them into the same model so you can do a query off that model off that single common data model that's very very difficult Excellent. We got one more question? Yeah. Uh, I guess we got two. Yep. We'll do, they're quick. We can do two. Uh, number one killer in the United States, medical mistakes. Do you do any projects around that? Yeah, so QI, QA is, is uh, Im important. I don't personally, but we, and um, it's not officially research, although we will probably, we being, we'll probably work with that team. Um, I don't per personally, uh, uh, that's something that will be on my radar of, uh, you know, uh, assessing how well um, medical centers are doing internally is very, very important question. All right, one last, one last question over here. You mentioned the NLP, uh, clinical notes. Are you doing bad words on that then? Are they short enough that that makes the most sense? Um, we aren't, so uh, that's a long, that's a long, easy question, but a long answer. There are, are, let's just say that there are groups out there at other medical centers who are doing bag of words. So that's what I believe Nigam Shah's approach at Stanford has been. Um, and uh, uh, we, our NLP group at UW Medicine is led by a faculty member in our department, and they are actually looking at syntactic use as well. All right, Anthony, you better be quick. All right. Um, at Teams this year, a lot of these were, yeah, there are several vendors. Uh, how do we tend to manage all of these silos of ideas coming around? Yeah. Lots of vendors, disparity talks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, so how could we begin to solve that? Problem? We are, um, we at the University of Washington are lucky enough to have two EMRs um, in the medical center, uh, which is a challenge, Cerner and Epic. 
um, and synthesizing them is a challenge. And the you know the idea of of, of having one EMR is has been discussed, uh, and that is it's a it's a huge issue. This is the the fact that data models are different between different systems. Some of them are homegrown even, and uh, so then you have to kind of figure out what the data model is on the fly. <laughs>